and we move on to the yeah, next presentation yeah, that's more complex structure, yeah. the eco profile rheumatic heart disease i'd like to invite professor ib vijayalakshmi she is a professor of cardiology at victoria medical college in bengaluru karnataka and uh, she'll be speaking for the next 20 minutes with a discussion from the floor professor ib vijayalakshmi respected chairpersons and dear delegates it's a pleasure to be here once again and i feel that there are two things which are very difficult in life one is to climb himalaya and the second one is to speak after a good lunch when you are all interested in siesta and the third important is after speaking like a good speaker like uh, punam malhotra so let me see eco profile of course it's my love in rheumatic heart disease hippocrates in 400 bc provided the first description of arthritis zones criteria in 1944 was modified remodified revised re revised totally five times and the sixth was in 2015 and in spite of that more than 50% of rheumatic fever rheumatic heart disease detected in the surveys and the health checkup camps are unaware of their disease more than 70% do not receive secondary prophylaxis regularly this is according to the uh, who bulletin the most tragic thing is more than 2 lakh children die directly attributable to the rheumatic fever or rheumatic heart disease and their consequences however the acute diagnosis of carditis is very essential as timely management can make the heart nearly normal in 35 to 40% of the cases to prevent the recurrence of the rheumatic activity and to put them on secondary prophylaxis echo is a must but the precise diagnosis is missing and unless according to the 2015 echo has been made essential the reason for this was a number of workers came out with their data and our own data which was published in 2005 in cardiology in young we showed that only 59% of the clinically diagnosed carditis had a echo criteria echo diagnosis whereas nearly 40% of them were wrong diagnosis because just tachycardia fever and all the criteria that the zones criteria fits in are not because our patients had fever due to other thing tuberculosis congenital heart disease that means there is an element of over diagnosis if we rely upon the clinical diagnosis at the same time the children with polyarthralgia where polyarthralgia is a minor criteria in the past now that has been made as a major criteria now we were missing the diagnosis because nearly 46% of these children with polyarthralgia had the echo features and here you can see that this patient was on penicillin prophylaxis because there was a murmur there was fever everything and then you know i said how can a 11 years old child had hypertension i when i look you can clearly see that there is an endo uh, endocardial glistening and the endocardial glistening never occurs in rheumatic fever this is an indication that the patient has got sub endocardial ischemia and that can occur in a child with an alkappa so when we did the short axis and all the angio you can see that the left coronary artery is arising from the pulmonary artery so unless we do the echo this diagnosis would have continued this is another patient who had fever raised esr and then there was a murmur they put the child on steroids thinking that it is a case of rheumatic fever and in fact if you look at the echo you can see that there is a subarachnoid i mean subaortic membrane and this patient had a flaring of the uh, primary complex and then had a tuberculous meningitis and treated in nimhans and then referred to me so here echo shows that the clinically the diagnosis was wrong and look at the picture it the echo shows the thickening the beaded appearance and all the features of echo are very beautifully seen uh, in the echo and once again just because there is an mr the murmur is there and there is tachycardia it is not rheumatic so here you can see that it's a dilated lv with the central jet and the mitral valves are normal aortic valves are normal this is a dilated cardiomyopathy with a 
MR with this functional MR. So this is how ECHO tells us whether we are over-diagnosing or under-diagnosing. So the pathological mitral regurgitation, it is extremely important to make out. It should be seen in more than two planes and it should be more than one centimeter beyond the valve and we should have good features. And when it comes to the echo, clinically we cannot make out all the features, what the cause of the mitral regurgitation. But here you can see that with the echo, we can make out whether there is a mild MR. So here echo can tell whether it's a mild, moderate, severe uh, regurgitation. Echo can also detect the mechanism of mitral regurgitation, whether it is valvulitis, valve prolapse, annulitis, ventricular enlargement, caudal rupture, all these things can be made out by the echo and this cannot be detected clinically. So here you can see that echo is the key because the caudal tear, severe MR, tricuspid regurgitation, all the features are clearly made out by the echocardiography. And apart from that, whether the mitral valve, aortic valve, posterior valve, all tricuspid valve, whether they are thickened edematous can be made out. Less than 4 millimeter is normal. And if it is more than 4 millimeter, it is rheumatic. And we saw that almost 93% of the rheumatic fever patients have the thickening. And apart from that, you can see that beautifully hyperechogenic submitral structures are very nicely seen in case of rheumatic fever. That's not the feature in the non-rheumatic cases. And if you see a tiny aphthous ulcers like thrombi here, and these are the ones at the rim of the mitral valve, you get the beaded appearance because of this. So what a pathology shows after the autopsy can be seen by the echocardiographer before, and this is the beaded appearance in the short axis, very beautifully seen. And sometimes the beaded appearance can be seen even over the papillary muscle and here you can see that this is a severe carditis with almost edematous mitral AML as well as a PML and along with the beaded appearance on the uh, submitral structures. And we are all taught about the rheumatic nodules clinically but then those nodules also can be made out on the echocardiography and these are nothing but the uh, uh, nodules inflammated over which there is a fibrous capsule and that's how you get in a short axis and this and this is almost 9 millimeter and this is how you get the beaded appearance and this was a 3 years old child diagnosed elsewhere as a congenital mitral regurgitation by the clinicians but this on echo had the echo pointers of rheumatic fever because there was thickening beaded appearance and then this was Though the child is only three years old and this was not a, 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 a congenital, it was a rheumatic. And here you can see that the thickening beaded appearance not only of the mitral and even the aortic valve was there. So this patient was put on a penicillin prophylaxis. Now this is a six years old child. You can see that there is a non-compaction and somebody made it as a non-compaction causing the failure. But in reality, you can clearly see that the posterior mitral leaflet is totally flare and that is causing an eccentric severe mitral regurgitation and this patient had rheumatic features of thickening, nodularity, beaded appearance and all that. And on, in the, on the contrary, this is 11 years old child who was treated as rheumatic fever but in fact it is not. It was in fact a perforation of the anterior mitral leaflet through the perforation the regurgitation was occurring. So this is how the echo can be precise in making the diagnosis. And this patient was put on penicillin, um, put on steroids and you can see the how he is bloated. And this patient who had the caudal tear of both anterior mitral leaflet as well as the posterior mitral leaflet, even if he is immersed in the drum of steroids, he is not going to improve. What he requires is the mitral valve repair at the earliest. So we came out with our criteria of 16. Out of 16, if we have more than 6 points, then that is rheumatic and less than 6, it is not rheumatic. And this echo criteria was published in Cardiology in Young in 2008 and it was recommended for the global reading by the committee. And this is how the echo criteria has come. 
according to the echo criteria if you look at this patient has got a myxomat as well redundant mitral valve prolapse 2 point and regurgitation 2 points so only 4 points and that is not rheumatic and whereas here mitral valve prolapse 2 points mitral regurgitation 2 point mitral valve thickening 2 pericardial effusion 2 caudal tear 2 so echo score is 10 so this is definitely rheumatic and this is not rheumatic so just having pathological mitral regurgitation is not a criteria we have to have the other features of rheumatic fever so echo detectable subclinical carditis is extremely important and in the 2015 uh, revision they have taken the data from 23 uh, uh, papers and out of uh, three largest series in the world two are from India and they were ours and here you can see that even subclinical carditis is extremely important to our disbelief this is the three years old child and had a uh, uh, what to say the both mitral stenosis as well as tricuspid stenosis and without echo, we would have made it as a congenital, but here the, all the features of rheumatic were there. So not only the echo helps in acute carditis and also in established mitral stenosis, and not only that, whether it is suitable for balloon valvoplasty or not. <laughs> And apart from that, after balloon valvoplasty, it helps us. If there is a tricuspid valve organic lesion, then they don't do as well as the isolated mitral stenosis. And apart from that, after balloon valvoplasty, whether there is a mitral regurgitation, what is the grade of mitral regurgitation, whether there is a caudal tear, all of that can be made out by the echocardiography. And here you can see that out of all the four cardiac chambers, the LV is so small because the mitral stenosis is so tight. And in such a patient, orifice was just 0.2 square centimeter. That is the smallest orifice I've ever dilated in a juvenile mitral stenosis. So juvenile mitral stenosis is a very difficult uh, situation where echo is very handy for us to decide whether we have got adequate uh, uh, split or not. So in this patient, we could achieve only 1.4 and that is enough for the body surface area. And here you can see that the post uh, 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 balloon valve plasty, the gradient came down from 35 to 13 and that's an extremely good result for a child and this is how juvenile mitral stenosis are helped. But not all the patients in the, the juvenile mitral stenosis have good result. Sometimes when they have associated aortic regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation and also the severe pulmonary artery hypertension, they don't do as well as the adult patients. And apart from that, the submitral structure stenosis is very high so they have stenosis at the mitral uh, pulmonary artery stenosis mitral valve and the submitral portion and this submitral portion invariably we don't dilate but sometimes if it is very tight with the peripheral balloon we are dilating even the submitral and here you can see that this balloon shape is not all right because the distal portion of the balloon is caught in the submitral structure and that's how it is deformed and even in the echo we can make out that it is caught in the submitral and if we try to forcibly dilate it we will rupture the cordae and that has to be opened and then only we have to go for the other. So the cursor has to be kept properly to see the aortic stenosis, tricuspid stenosis, tricuspid regurgitation. Everything can be made out by the echocardiography which is difficult for an individual. So here you can see that there is a giant left atrium. In other echo I showed the tiny left ventricle and here it is the giant left atrium. This is the biggest a chamber in the cardiac thing and this needs the um, LA plication by the surgeon and the maze procedure as the patient had the atrial fibrillation. So echo can make out the severity of the mitral regurgitation, severity of the aortic regurgitation as you see here and then we can decide whether the patient requests uh, 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 DV, uh, I mean, uh, dual, I mean, both the valvular replacement or one valve can be repaired and other one has to be replaced. And apart from that, the severe AR and MR, these patients, this requires double valve replacement and when we are deciding, the echo is very crucial to decide what has to be done. When a patient comes like this with a gangrene, you know that it is an embolization and the embolization could be due to the vegetation or due to the uh, 
thrombus. Now here you can see that this is a thrombus which is highly mobile, almost grade 4 mobility of the in the LVOT. Any moment it will embolize causing the gangrene. And apart from that, echo helps in pregnant ladies. So this was a lady who had 0.4 a square centimeter valve. She came with the hemoptysis almost half a liter every day and then in the past they used to die and the uh, ignorant people used to blame the child for having made the mother die. But now we know that we did the emergency balloon valvplasty by covering the abdomen under the fluoros, uh, not fluoroscopy, but by the echo. Here you can see that balloon is across and literally when we dilate, we know how much we have dilated and whether the gradient has come down or not. So in pregnant ladies, we can literally do all the balloon valvplasty under the uh, echocardiography. So therapeutic decision making is based on the echocardiographic assessment and the grade of MR if more than 2 we do not uh, send them for uh, surgery, I mean send them for the balloon and then if there is a left atrial appendage or the left atrial body clot that is a contraindication. Here in the echo there is a doubt in the appendage we didn't see what it was but when we did the TE you can see that something is coming out like a flower and that is coming there is a clot which is adherent to the left atrial appendage and the soft clot which is highly mobile is protruding into the uh, left atrium in the body and apart from that you can see the spontaneous echo contrast there indicating that this is the patient. So here the decision is very important Usually, whenever there is a left atrial appendage clot, we give them anticoagulation and then take up later on. But here, this is very risky. Both the balloon valvplasty as well as this is extremely risky because once the layer is gone, the inside thing will almost come out like a puran pole, you know, the whole thing will come out and this will have a multiple embolization that will be very, very risky. And apart from that, if there is a layered clot, body clot, and in the apical port, I mean in the roof, all these things can be made out by the echo. So friends, impact of knowing the pointers and pitfalls in the echo is extremely important. Patients with carditis are more likely to be detected during their first attack of rheumatic fever. Detecting the subclinical carditis will prevent them from the more relaxed inappropriate secondary prophylaxis thereby we can bring more number of patients into the net of secondary prophylaxis and there is a significant prognostic implication of finding a normal heart from finding an abnormal heart. If the valve in, uh, involvement is there the patient requires the prophylaxis for the lifelong. If the valve is normal we can stop the penicillin prophylaxis after 5 years or 21 years whichever is the least. So to carry home messages, echo is useful in precise and early diagnosis of carditis in acute rheumatic fever. It is key technique used to assess the valve damage, to decide the management strategy and monitor the progression of the chronic rheumatic heart disease. A comprehensive evaluation of the st stenotic and regurgitant lesions of mitral, aortic, tricuspid and pulmonary valves is possible only with the echocardiography and hence the periprocedural echo is very useful for interventionists. Echo assisted balloon valvplasty in pregnant ladies is life saving. Life threatening contraindications like left atrial thrombus or the left uh, uh, the appendage thrombus can be assessed by echocardiography. So friends to conclude John F. Kennedy once said the children may be victims of their fate but let them not be victims of our neglect and hence the Zones criteria, the AHA has included echo as a major criteria now and they have insisted that every suspected patient, the echo has to be done and if there is a controversy, the penicillin prophylaxis has to be given for one year so that the children do not become the uh, victim of our negligence. Thank you very much for your patience and the kind. Thank care. you, Thank Dr. Vijayalakshmi, for your lucid and crisp presentation and I think all the postgraduates and residents must go through that uh, cardiology young 2008 for uh, getting, uh, I mean, all the ideas about how to diagnose the rheum active rheumatic fever. Because now of late, after the pro penicillin prophylaxis and uh, advancement, uh, we are not able to see the active rheumatic fever with same like features which you used to see about two or three decades before. 
So I think uh, you have a good knowledge about uh, how to diagnose in early cases of rheumatic fever. And I thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vijayalakshmi, for your very good, excellent presentation. Thank you. Yeah, I think I would also like to congratulate her because uh, she has really done some pioneering work in, uh, you know, looking at acute rheumatic fever. The beaded appearance, I think, is your finding. And uh, I think uh, the, the, uh, the very, very few, res very little research is done in India and many, many aspects of, in cardiology. Uh, but this is one aspect uh, where I think, uh, you know, India has come forward and I think your criteria are really uh, very good. And I think a lot of people are following it, although there may not be any official endorsement. Yeah. But people are actually using those criteria for diagnosing acute rheumatic fever. So if the time permits, I would like to tell one thing. When in 1998 presented my echo data in rheumatic fever, the cardiac is the Patricia Ferreri, who was the chairman of Zones Criteria, was in the audience in the Fairway University. Ed Kaplan, who was a part of the committee, now was also there. At the end of the Grand Rounds lecture, he said, everybody is not as good as you are in the echo, so there will be overdiagnosis. And that's the reason they were skeptical. And at that time, I asked him one question. Ed, if God permits you, will you commit uh, on the error, error on the right side or the wrong side? He said, what's that? Erring on the wrong side is missing the diagnosis, they going for the valve replacement, and then the whole burden of the surgery or erring on the right side is making a wrong diagnosis, putting them on the penicillin prophylaxis, and at that time he said, oh, you are disarming me, and he raised both the hands, and after 15 years, now he has agreed that echo is important, and they have included, and thank you very much. Can I ask a One other comment I'd like to make is, the, in terms of the carditis, you know, because the LA wall would be involved also, and I think maybe what, what you should do, since you have some cases of acute rheumatic fever still uh, existing in India, is to use speckle tracking yes. uh, to check the LA function, LA wall. Yes. Uh, select the LA wall motion and function. That may be something you might add to your, your criteria. Also, wondered whether, have you seen any beaded appearance on the tracker speed valve ever? Yes, thanks. On the tracker speed valve. Sir? Beaded, beaded appearance on the tracker speed valve. Yeah. yeah. So, in fact, uh, almost uh, we did the study and only clinically, the tricuspid regurgitation was detected only in nine patients, whereas it was detected by echo in 60. So the, uh, the aortic regurgitation and tricuspid regurgitation and tricuspid stenosis all are clinically missed, whereas echo is absolutely fantastic for that. Okay, so there is one thing. May I say, sir, yes. just, one, one, just a one, comment, one, Professor Nanda? Yeah, there is one other comment. Well, Vijay Lakshmi, par excellence. You yes. did an excellent job in spite of the computer failing. So thank you There's very much, sir. This. But what I want to say that, see, I learned for the first time that in rheumatic carditis, you can detect the changes early like that. Yes, sir. Because we have been case, getting cases like that, but to be honest with you, I, we don't refer to the cardiologist for the echo. Now yes. I will start referring it. For documented cases of valvular disease, of course, we do it. We do it but yes. not for rheumatic carditis are suspected like that. I learned a lot from your talk. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. Thank you very much, sir. You are my guru and I'm blessed to have a compliment from you. Uh, one just comment. There is a clinical scenario where there is a chronic rheumatic valvular heart disease. Sometimes I come back to you with uh, arthralgia or fever where there is a suspicion that there is a carditis. It is always a clinical issue, you know, there are no nodules, no erythema marginata, most often yes. in our Indian patients. So we found that you do a gadolinium MRI, uh, it shows up the pericarditis. Yes. Or uh, you do a PET imaging, it lights up the pericardium. Correct. That now is more and more being talked about and published yes. Yes. as a proof of carditis in that group of patients, yes. where otherwise it is difficult. So that's a very valid point because if the valves are not involved in the first attack, they are unlikely to be in the next. But if they are damaged, subclinical carditis is there, with the next recrudescence of rheumatic activity, they will be further damaged. So the echo is extremely good and that's a very valid point, sir. Thank you. Much. Uh, Professor Vijay Lakshmi, yes. ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the academic deliberation of this session. From We'd like to request our chairpersons to present uh, the token of affection to our invited speakers, uh, Drs. K.K. Kapoor, uh, Professor Poonam Malhotra and uh, Professor Vijay Lakshmi.